Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, before we continue further in Romans eight, we 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 are up until verse eight, Romans eight till verse eight. Um, are there any questions, any thoughts, any things you want to highlight? Anybody has any questions? Conan, you have a question? All right, no questions? Okay. All right, I'm seeing your responses in the chat. Uh, no questions so far. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> let's continue on from verse nine, Romans eight, verse nine, right? So we've come to, we did till verse eight, which is very, very sobering, very sobering that uh, if believers are carnally minded, uh, this is what's going to happen. And so, you know, many times when we pray and minister to people, of course, people want life, they want peace. Uh, they don't want death at work in their lives. Um, and uh, we can pray for them. The anointing of God will, you know, take care of that particular situation. But, you know, it's not a permanent solution. I mean, thank God that at that moment, because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, whatever was causing death in their situation or their life or whatever was uh, you know depriving them of life and peace at that moment can be addressed by the anointing of the holy spirit it's not a permanent solution why because they may receive a miracle they may receive a healing they may receive a deliverance but at the same believer continues to living carnally minded things are going to repeat again because to be carnally minded is death. There is no life in peace. That means there is no Zoe, the abundant life, no peace. So they'll be back in that same situation. They'll come for another prayer, another deliverance, another. And so many believers are living like this. They live from one deliverance to the next. They need to go find somebody who's anointed to pray for them. But that is not the answer. The answer is they need to know how to live in the spirit. They need to know how to go from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded, to walk in the spirit. That's the real answer. Because the law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets every one of us free from the law of sin and death, provided we walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh, provided we live spiritually minded and not carnally minded. So that's the real answer. Then that's what we need to uh, bring believers to. Now, thank God for the anointing. Thank God for healing and deliverance and miracles. We all need it. And, uh, you know, it will, it will address the situation at that moment. The real solution is we have to move into being spiritually minded. So in verse 9, Paul writes, he says to the believers, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And those believers, you're not supposed to be living in the flesh. You're not supposed to be living according to the flesh. You're supposed to be in the spirit. And why is that possible? Because... The Spirit of God is dwelling in you. Now, if anyone has, does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of it. So he says, this is verse 9. See, if you don't even have the Holy Spirit, you don't even belong to Jesus. But he's saying, believers, you have the Holy Spirit in you. So you have no excuse to live in the flesh. But you need to be in the Spirit. In the Spirit. So again, that phrase, you are not in the flesh, but you are 
in the spirit. So that's the life of a believer. It's a life in the spirit, meaning you are living out of the spirit. A nice analogy is that of a fish in water. The fish is living in the water. Believer, you are to live in the spirit. So the fish is swimming, but it's fully surrounded by water. Its life comes through the water. You know, uh, I know in biology class, we should study how uh, the water comes through and that goes through the fins and it's able to, you know, uh, uh, Breathe that way, you know, literally. Uh, take out the oxygen that's in the water. So the transfer of oxygen from the water goes into the fish. Just like we human beings, we breathe air, and air goes from oxygen into our body. In the, when the fish is swimming in the water, that's what happened. So its source of life is from the water. It's fully surrounded by water. So that's how a believer is supposed to live. We are, we are supposed to be fish in the spirit, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Uh, he says, you're not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. You're living in the spirit. You're surrounded by the spirit and your life is originating from the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy, that's a believer. And why is it possible? Because the spirit of God is in you. He says in verse 9, the spirit of God dwells in you. So he's dwelling in me. So my life is coming from him. I'm in the spirit. Verse 10. Now, if Christ is in you. Now, it's very interesting. He says in verse 9, the spirit of Christ is in you. Verse 10, Christ is in you. So here's a new title for the Holy Spirit. We see he's called the Spirit of Christ. In verse uh, 2, he was called the Spirit of Life. In verse 9, he's called the Spirit of Christ. Of course, we know Spirit of God. We know that title for the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God. But very interesting, in verse nine, he's a spirit of Christ. That means all who Christ is, the Holy Spirit is to you and me. That's why he's called the spirit of Christ. And remember Jesus said, you know, in John's, uh, John 16, uh, John 14, 15, 16, he said, you know, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I will send the Holy Spirit another comforter so he's the spirit of christ he brings jesus to you and me so that's why he says the spirit of christ and then in verse 10 he says and christ is in you so how is christ in you and me by his spirit so christ in you if christ is in you he says the body is dead because of sin. The body is dead because of sin. That means my body. Because of sin. Has death working in it. Now this is what he said in Romans 7. Death has been produced, has been produced in my body because sin has been there. And uh, sin has caused death to work in my body. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So I, in my spirit, I have received righteousness. Therefore, I have life in my spirit from the Holy Spirit. But Look at verse 11. So it doesn't stop with verse 10. 
verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, that is the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body. Give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. So think of what he's saying in verse 10 and 11. They're connected. He says Christ is in you because the spirit of Christ is in you. Now sin has been working in your body. So the body is dead or is dying. It's, I mean, not dead in the sense it's lifeless, but it's death has been at, has been at work in the body. That's why the body is dead. Spirit is life. But in your spirit, you have life. Your body, because of sin at work, it has, it has had death in you. But because the Spirit of God is in you, God gives life to your mortal body by His Spirit. God gives life to your mortal body, your death-doomed body. So this body of ours is mortal. It's death doomed, meaning eventually it's going to die. But while I'm here on this earth, because the Spirit of God is living in me, the Spirit of life is in me. God is giving life to my body, my death doomed body. So this connects back to Romans 8, verse 2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And death. Here's how we are free from the death that is produced by sin. So sin has been producing death in our body talking about the physical body. Paul acknowledges that in Romans 8, 10, Christ is in you, but the body is having death at work because of sin. But there is an answer. Even though your body is mortal, it will die one day. But until it dies, the Holy Spirit is giving life to your body. So this is very powerful. It's really a scripture for healing for our physical bodies. The Spirit of God who lives in me gives life to my mortal body. He's giving life to my mortal. My body is mortal. Yes, of course, it's mortal. It's going to die. And because of sin that has been working in this body for so long, but yet, because the Spirit of life is in me, He is giving life to my body. That means every cell, every single cell, in my body is well because the spirit of life is giving life to every cell in my body. We need to acknowledge that the spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death because de sin was working death. Now the Holy Spirit is reversing even that. He's giving life. So you and I should expect that until our dying moment, we want the life that is coming from the Holy Spirit to fill our bodies, affect our bodies, keep us in good health, touch every cell in my body and keep every cell in my body in good health. Now, does that mean we'll never grow old? No, Paul did write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that the outward man is decaying. So that's that's and, and, and we will come to it a little later in Romans 8 itself. That uh he, he goes, he talks about that, that you know the outward, outward man is perishing. But while there is this natural process of decay and corruption, which he addresses in Romans 8 a little later on, I can expect God to give life to my body, keep me in good health till the last moment. Is this real? Yeah, it's real. 
Why? Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in me and he's the spirit of life. And verse 11 says, he gives life to my mortal body. We can choose to believe it or we can say, well, I don't want it. Well, it's your choice, but I want to believe it. I want to believe that the spirit of life gives life to my mortal body, that God quickens my mortal body through his spirit who dwells in me. Now, I just want to go on a little side journey. Uh, we'll come back here. But uh, I want us to look at two references. If you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, we'll come back to Romans 8, okay? This is a little side journey, and then we'll come back. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Can we read it, please? Can somebody read it for us? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. We always carry around the death of Jesus in our bodies. In that way, the life of Jesus can be shown in our bodies. We who are alive are always in, in the, uh, danger of death because we are serving Jesus, so his life can be shown in our earthly bodies. Okay. Now, how, how did your last part read of verse 11? So his life can be shown in our... In our earthly bodies. In our earthly bodies. Okay, in our earthly bodies. Okay, okay. So both in, uh, thank you, in verses 10 and 11, notice what Paul is saying. The life of Jesus is manifested in our body. Again, in verse 11, the life of Jesus is manifested in our mortal or earthly bodies, the life of Jesus. Now, the same chapter, he does go on to say that uh, our outward man is perishing, okay? I understand that. But while that is happening, at the same time, he says the life of Jesus is made visible in our mortal bodies. So you and I must expect that, Lord Jesus. Let your life be made visible in my body. And Paul is saying, look, while we are suffering in our body, in the midst of that, the life of Jesus is made visible. Let's look at one example in Acts chapter 14 of what Paul is referring to. Acts 14 can we read verses 19 to 21, please? Acts 14, 19 to 21, please. Then Jew from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to the city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Thank you. So, Paul is traveling through the district of Galatia and in the southern part of the district of Galatia, which is today in modern day Turkey. It's on the eastern part or yeah, central eastern part of Turkey, southern part, district of Galatia. And there were many cities. There was the city of Antioch, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. So they're going on that journey there. And they have preached in Antioch. They've come to Lystra. They're preaching in Lystra. And what happens? Some people from Lystra, uh, from Antioch, uh, and also some from Iconium, they've come over to Lystra and they attack Paul. And here it says that they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, when they stoned Paul, it wasn't like they threw one stone, one small stone at him. 
when they stoned people, they meant to kill some, kill that person. Paul himself had Stephen stoned. Stephen died. It's now the same thing is happening to him. They dragged him, his body, out of the city and left him as dead. I mean, it must have been terrible. So Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 4, 10 and 11. We are bearing in our body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He said there in 2 Corinthians 4, 10, he said, we are, uh, we are uh, delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That's what's happening here. But then something very interesting happens. It says in verse 20, when the disciples, so the disciples from Lystra, they came, the believers. They gathered around him, Acts 14, verse 20. It says, he rose up and went into the city. If a man had been stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead, He won't be able to rise up like this. And he won't be able to walk into the sit back into the city. He will have to be bandaged and carried in a stretcher to the city. Here it's saying he rose up and he walked into the city. And the next day, not next year, but next day, he and Barnabas, uh, it says here, yeah, they left to Derby, and they went preaching. They made many disciples. And they came back to the same cities where people had stoned. They came back to Lister, Derby, Iconium, Antioch. Same. Now, humanly speaking, this is not possible. If a man is stoned, he cannot get up and walk. And he cannot travel the next day and go preach. And he'll probably be bandaged for the next six months. Paul is saying, in our body, we are delivered to death. We are bearing the marks of the Lord Jesus. But the life of Jesus is manifested in our body. That means the life of God, the spirit of life, had supernaturally healed him when the disciples gathered around him. There could be no other way, no other explanation. How can a man who's been stoned and left for dead get up and walk back into the city and travel the next day to go preach. If they said he had given him one caning, okay, we can understand. Maybe they just gave him one cane and uh, left him. But here it's saying they stoned him and they took his body out of the city and left it as though it was dead. So it only had to be the life of God that changed his body and I don't know how it must have happened but whatever God did enabled Paul to stand up on his feet go back and then start traveling the next day so going back to Romans 8 11 and Paul writes God quickens our mortal body by his spirit who lives in us He's speaking from experience. He knows what he's talking about. That though there is all these things affecting the body, God is giving life to our mortal body, our earthly body, by his spirit who is living in us. So I want to encourage us based on Romans 8, 11, 
to expect the life of God to touch our physical bodies. So when people are sick and you're ministering to them, you know, you, you, you encourage them, hey, the Holy Spirit is in you for a reason. Of course, there are many things he does, but one of the things he does is he gives life to your mortal body. He quickens your body through his spirit. So you begin to acknowledge that. You begin to say, God, touch my body with the life of your spirit and give life to my body. You know, whether it's whatever sickness, disease, let the body receive life from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's Romans 8, 1 to 11. Let's jump now to Romans chapter 8. Let's go forward from verses 12. Let's read all the way to verse uh, 17. Romans 8, 12 to 17. We're continuing now, please. Somebody could read this. Romans 8, 8, 20 to 20. 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit put the date, the dates of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit of bondage again to fear but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out abba father the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and if children then heirs heirs of god and join heirs with the christ if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together yeah thank you Thank you. So, what's the conclusion of what he has spoken to us so far? So he says, verse 12, Therefore, brethren, okay, I've told you all this, therefore, meaning, let's sum it up. Therefore, brethren, now remember, he's speaking to brethren. He's speaking to believers. He says, okay, believers, I've told you all this, I've told you how to live. Therefore, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So this is it. Believers, we don't owe the flesh anything. You're not a debtor to the flesh. So when your flesh cries out for attention, tell the flesh, I don't owe you anything. I don't need to pay attention. I don't have to pay anything, not even attention. I owe you nothing. We are there is not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We don't have to give in to the dictates, the desires, and the drives of the flesh. No. Verse 13. I remember he's talking to believers again. He says, for if you live, if, so it's not needed, but if you do, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Once again, he's repeating that same warning he had uh, spoken about earlier. If, to be carnally minded is death. Same thing again. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Believers, if you live according to the flesh, you'll have death at work in you, both natural and spiritual, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So what must the believer do? How is, what is the life of the believer? By the Spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit, be put to death the deeds of the body. That means, it's referring, of course, to the sinful, evil deeds of the body, the works of the flesh. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm putting to death, meaning bringing to an end the sinful, evil desires of my body. It means with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm saying no to the desires of the flesh. 
and what's going to be the result? I will live. I will have life in peace. Is what Paul is saying. So this sums it up. This is the way a believer lives a life of victory over the flesh by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Because the law of the Spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin and death. So, he says in verse 14, look, all, all of us, sons of God, we are people who are led by the Spirit of God. So we are not people who are led by the flesh. We are led by the Spirit. If you're led by the flesh, what do the flesh says we do? Then you're being led by the flesh. We're not led by the flesh. We are led by the Spirit. That means what the Holy Spirit says, we do. He leads, we follow. So he says, verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit, who, how can you tell, you know, who are the children of, who are the true sons of God? They are led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit is directing them, moving them, and they are following the Holy Spirit. They are walking according to the Spirit. They are led by the Spirit. These are the children of God. Now, verse 15, he says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage, but you received the spirit of adoption. So contrast, contrast. Also a new title for the Holy Spirit, spirit of adoption. So we see him, he's a spirit of life. He's a spirit of Christ. He's a spirit of adoption. So he says, you didn't receive the spirit of bondage, meaning something that puts you in captivity. But you receive the spirit of adoption that brings us into sonship. And we can call God Abba, Father. So we are led by the Spirit. And this Spirit is not a Spirit means the Holy Spirit is not the Spirit who puts us in slavery and keeps us in fear. No, that's not what God is doing. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit to keep us in bondage and fear. The Spirit of God, He's a Spirit of adoption. He brings us into this wonderful place of liberated sons and daughters of God. He says, we cry out, Abba, Father. So contrast. One is putting people in bondage and fear. He said, that's not the kind of spirit we have received. So anything that is bringing people into bondage and fear is not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption, releases us to be children of God. It says that we have the spirit of adoption by which we can cry out, Abba, Father. Instead of being fearful slaves, we are liberated sons and daughters. So this helps us understand what is the work of the Spirit? What is the work of a Spirit that is not the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of adoption, liberates us. Something that's opposite puts us in bondage and fear. And then he says, thus, verse 16, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And how do we cry at our Father? Because the Spirit 
bears witness with our spirit. Bears witness with our spirit. So he is unveiling to us different aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He's saying, we are led by the Spirit. And now he's saying the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Different facets of how he works. He's a spirit of adoption. He brings us into this place where we can call God Father. But he also bear, he's a spirit who bears witness with our spirit. Very interesting. Spirit, Holy Spirit, bears witness. It means to testify. To bear witness means to testify, to speak affirmingly, to speak convincingly. The Spirit bears witness. Where? With our spirit. So this is unveiling to us that there is communication between Holy Spirit and my spirit. Holy Spirit and my spirit. Holy Spirit is speaking to my spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving uh, a testimony, is giving conviction, is giving, you know, he's speaking to my spirit. He's bearing witness. It's unveiling to us. Hey, interesting. The Holy Spirit is in me. He does a lot of things. He's the law of the spirit of life who helps me overcome the flesh. He's the spirit of life who gives life to my mortal body. He's the spirit of life who leads me. He's the spirit of life who speaks to me. He bears witness to my spirit. So Romans 8 is unveiling to us many different facets of the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of that we see in verse 16. He bears witness with our spirit. That means he is testifying. He's speaking. He's giving evidence. He is giving conviction. He bears witness with our spirit. And in this particular case, the witness or the conviction that he gives us is, we are children of God. So this is your birth certificate. How do you know you're a child of God? Show me your birth certificate where the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. I know I'm a child of God. Why? The Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. And if we are children, Verse 70, if we are children, it puts us in this place, this esteemed, honorable place, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now this is, something because he's now using you know kingdom terminology to be an heir of God a successor so to speak you're an heir next in line and you're a joint heir with Christ co-heir you share with Christ this is amazing. This is who we are as children of God. We are heirs and co-heirs. We share in everything that Christ has. Of course, we are not deity. Christ is deity. We are not. But in the context of all that he has already spoken to us in Romans 5, Romans 6, we are heirs. We share in all that Christ accomplished. We share in all that Christ has at the right hand of the Father. We are co-heirs with Christ because he has become all of this to us. We, we share in his righteousness because he has become righteousness to us. We share in his authority because he has raised us up and made us sit together. 
So we are co-heirs. And so he says, you know, so continue verse 17. So we can suffer with him because we know we'll be glorified together. So even if we suffer, we know we're going to be glorified. Because we're heirs of God, we're joint heirs with Christ. The suffering here He has mentioned in verse 13, you put to death the deeds of your body. So there are many kinds of suffering that we will face as people on the earth, whether it's um, persecution, affliction, all those things. But there is also the suffering that is already mentioned in verse 13. We put to death the deeds of the body. Now that's not easy. It's not easy. Just as a cross reference, I'll just do this quickly. Uh, as a cross reference, you go to First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four, verses one and two, please. First Peter. Four, one and two, please. Somebody could read it. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should leave the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Yeah. Thank you. So, First Peter 4, 1 and 2, he's talking about a different kind of suffering. He's talking about suffering in the flesh that causes us to cease from sin. So let's look at Jesus, how he suffered. So you also suffer, be willing to suffer. In this case, you're suffering because you are seizing from sin. So, going back to Romans 8 and verse 17, it says, look, we are children of God, we are heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Christ, and if we suffer, and one of the aspects of suffering is in putting to death, the flesh, so that we can seize from sin. And if we suffer, we know we will be glorified together. So this putting to death the deeds of the body, is going to only cause us to be glorified together. That means to walk in glory together. To walk in the glory of being an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. So how do we walk in this glory? So you know, it's wonderful. The Bible says, we are heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Christ. It's wonderful. Wow. But how do you walk in that glory? Because it's a very glorious position. Heir of God, joint heir with Christ. How do you walk in that glory? If we suffer, we will be glorified together. We can walk in this glory together. And I'm putting it in the context of Romans 8. Of course, there's a future glory and uh, you know we will be enthroned with, uh, we will rule and reign with Christ in the millennium. All of that is there. That's, I'm not denying that. I'm putting it in the context of what he has just written for us. If we suffer, we will walk in glory together. As heirs of God, what is the glory is mentioned? 
as an heir of God as a joint heir with Christ. So for us to walk in the glory of being heirs and joint heirs, we must be willing to suffer the putting to death of the sinful deeds of our body by the Spirit. That's the key. So why, uh, I just want to close now. And, so why is it that we are not seeing believers walk as heirs, joint heirs, right here? That we are not willing to suffer the putting to death of the deeds of our body. We will pause here. Uh, any questions so far? I know we just a few more minutes, but any questions till this verse, verse 17? Okay, seeing your responses, anyone? Any questions, anybody? Okay, all right. No, but it's clear. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Thomas. Okay, okay. Yeah, I see your responses. Good. Let's just uh, pray together and uh, then we will dismiss. Can somebody lead us in prayer as we close up this class, please? Pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Daddy. We bless your holy name. Thank you for this wonderful time, especially the deeper revelations from the chapter, Romans chapter 8, Father. Thank you, Dad. Help us to led by the Spirit. Help us to walk in the Spirit, of Lord. We thank you. We praise you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. You paid the price and you've given your Spirit to live according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Help us to live according to the Spirit, of Lord. We thank you for this wonderful revelations. Bless each and every one. Let these words will be manifest in our spiritual walk and spiritual journey, Father. We thank you and praise you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. We'll take a quick break. I'll see you later. Thanks. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.